Hello and welcome to Baitu's Exam Prep IAS. Let's get started and look into our daily quiz. Let's look into the first question. Consider the following statement. Article 50 of the Constitution of India talks about the separation of the executive from the judiciary. Justice S. Abdul Nazir is the first retired judge of the Supreme Court to be appointed as a governor of a state. Which of the statements given above is are correct? The answer to this is one only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to former Supreme Court judge among six new governors appointed. So we have former Supreme Court judge Justice Abdul Nazir who was appointed as the governor. It is in this backdrop we have taken this practice question. Let's look into the first statement. The first statement reads, Article 50 of the Constitution of India talks about the separation of the executive from the judiciary. This statement is right. When you look at the United States of America, what we have is a clear-cut separation of powers. So what we have is legislature followed by the executive and judiciary. So there is clear-cut separation of powers when it comes to United States of America. But do we have a clear-cut separation of powers in India? No. Why? Because we have the legislature. From the legislature, they become part of the executive. So the legislature go on to become the executive because we have the parliamentary form of the government. And as a result, Article 50 only speaks about separation of powers between executive and judiciary. And we do do not have a clear cut separation of powers as we have in United States of America. So the first statement is right where article 50 of the constitution of India talks about separation of the executive from the judiciary. When you look into the second statement, Justice S. Abdul Nasser is the first retired judge of the Supreme Court to be appointed as a governor of a state. This statement is wrong. Why? That is because we have had previous judges as well as the chief justice who have also been appointed as the governors of of respective states. To give you an example, what we have is Justice M. Fatima Bibi was appointed as the governor. We also have former Chief Justice of India, Justice P. Satasivam, who was also appointed as the governor of Kerala. These are the examples where we have seen judges from the Supreme Court being appointed as the governors of the state. So the question that I am asking you is, should the Supreme Court judges or the High Court judges be allowed to take up executive roles? What is your opinion? Please put it on the comment section. Now let's look into the next practice question. With respect to major and minor minerals, which of the following statements is are correct? The major minor classification is on the basis of quantum availability of these minerals. Policy and legislation relating to minor minerals are dealt by the Ministry of Mines under the Central Government. Major minerals is defined under the Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is none. Why? That is because all the statements are incorrect. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to the minor minerals. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, it reads, the major minor classification is on the basis of quantum or the availability of these minerals. This statement is wrong. So basically, when you look at this particular classification, it has nothing to do with the availability or the quantity or the quantum of this particular mineral. Basically, it is more to do with with value of these minerals. So the first statement is wrong. When you look into the second statement, policy and legislation relating to minor minerals are delegated to the state government. So it is the state government which should be able to make the rules when it comes to the minor minerals. But when it comes to the major minerals, they are the ones which are being drafted or these laws are brought about by the Ministry of Mines. So we have major and minor. Minor are dealt by the state government, but major are dealt by the central government. So second statement once again is wrong. When you look into the third statement, major minerals is defined under the Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act. This statement is once again wrong. If you look into this act, what we have is the minor minerals which are defined. This includes building stones, gravel, ordinary clay, ordinary sand, other than the sand used for prescribed purposes. These are the minor minerals. So minor minerals are defined. So anything other than the minor minerals happens to be the major minerals. So is major minerals defined in this 
this definition of act? No, since it is not defined, third statement is also wrong. As part of the assignment, you have to put on the comment section. What are some of the examples of the major minerals? Please put it on the comment section. Now let's look into the next practice question. Which of the following statements is a correct with respect to index of the industrial production? It is calculated and published by the Office of Economic Advisor of the Ministry of Commerce and Industry every month. Base year for IIP is 2015 and 16. The eight core industries comprise 40.27% of the weight of the items included in the industrial production. The index of eight core industries highest weight is currently possessed by the refinery products industry. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is three and four only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to index of the industrial production, which is why we have taken this practice question. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, it is calculated and published by the Office of Economic Advisor. No, this statement is wrong. Why? That is because it is calculated and published by the Central Statistical Organization. So the first statement is wrong. When you look into the second statement, base year for IAP is 2015 and 16. No, this is one second wrong when you look into the base here it is 2011 and 12 so it is not 2015 and 16 and when you look into the third statement the eight core industries comprise 40.27 percent of the weight of the items this statement is right and the fourth statement is also right that is it is the refinery products industry now if we look into it what we have is coal 10.33 electricity 19.85 but when you look into the refinery products it is 28.04 percent which basically means it is the refinery products which has the maximum weightage now let's look into the next practice question consider the following statement it is the only tripartite un agency with government employer and worker representatives it was created in 1919 as part of the treaty of versailles that ended cold war one it is headquartered in geneva switzerland the above statements best describe international labor organization international monetary fund international telecommunication union world health organization the answer to this is international labor organization why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Indian Express makes a reference to International Labour Organization's conventions, which is why we have taken this practice question. So all the statements that we just discussed speaks about the International Labour Organization. So yes, it is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. It was created in 1919 as part of the Treaty of Versailles. And remember, the International Labour Organization happens to be the only tripartite UN agency with government, employer and worker representatives. This can be very, very important from the preliminary examination point of view. We have some of the important conventions of the International Labour Organization. This includes forced labour convention, abolition of forced labour convention, equal remuneration convention, discrimination convention, minimum age convention, worst forms of world labor convention freedom of association and protection of rights to organize convention right to organize and collective bargaining convention why are we discussing about convention because this article makes a reference to 189th convention what is this 189th convention is what you have to put on the comment section so basically the eight core conventions of the international labor organization basically provide relevance and bring justice to the workers in and around the world the conventions are basically drafted and formulated basically to ensure that all the economic challenges faced by the labor in and around the world are addressed they help the workers to get fair amount of pay they also help the workers to get equal treatment as well. They will also have bargaining as well. They would be able to discuss their problems with the employers. So it is about regulating the employment and its provisions. Now let's look into the next practice question. Consider the following statements in respect of financial emergency under Article 360 of the Constitution of India. 
a proclamation of financial emergency issued shall cease to operate at the expiration of two months unless before the expiration of that period it has been approved by the resolution of both houses of parliament if any proclamation of financial emergency is on operation it is competent for the president of india to issue directions for the reduction of salaries and allowances of all or any class of persons serving in connection with the affairs of the union but excluding the judges of the supreme court and the high court which of the statements given above is are correct the answer to this is one only this happens to be a previous year question from the year 2007 the first statement is right the second statement is wrong that is because it also includes supreme court judges as well as the high court judges it does not exclude but it includes the judges of the supreme court as well as the high court judges which is why the first statement is right the second statement is wrong now let's look into the fact of the day the fact of the day for today's discussion is micro led display technology let us try and understand what is this topic in greater detail we have number of companies who are now working on micro light emitting diodes this happens to be one of the technology which is going to revolutionize this idea of display on the mobile phones on the televisions so on and so forth we have companies like apple samsung who are just some of the companies who are developing the micro leds and lot number of companies are also going to explore this idea of micro led technology let us try and understand what is this micro led a micro led is basically an led what is an led it is nothing but a light emitting diode which basically converts the electrical energy that we have into the light energy so what is micro led it is nothing but a type of led that is light emitting diode which converts electrical energy into light one micro led measures less than 100 micrometers and it can be about one hundredth of the size of a conventional led what are the advantages of these micro led when we speak about advantages what exactly happens this is a kind of a display so basically this is a display which provides more color it also offers higher brightness as well and the amount of power consumption that this particular led has in comparison to oled is far less as well so what are the advantages micro led displays are brighter have better color reproduction and provide better viewing angles they make images appear as if they are painted on top of the devices class so it is much more brighter there is much more quality and the amount of power consumption in comparison to OLED is far in less micro LEDs have limitless scalability as they are resolution free bezel free ratio free and even size free the screen can be freely resized in any form for practical usage in addition to being self emissive micro leds also individually produce red green and blue colors without needing the same backlighting or color filters as conventional displays now the most important question is about what is the difference between micro led and oled when you look at they have similar traits they, when you compare them they have some advantages or they are almost same and there are also differences between micro led and oled what are the similarities when you look at the similarities both have led that is both have light emitting diodes in their name meaning they are both constructed from the light emitting diodes so they are constructed from the light emitting diodes that's the first similarity the two also have self emitting technology so each red green and blue sub pixel produces its own light these are some of the similarities but what are the differences the major difference is when you look at o led what you have is O in the LED which means it is organic and refers to the organic material used in the light producing part of the pixel stack but when it comes to micro LED what you have is the inorganic substance in O LED what you have is an organic substance in micro LED what you have is an inorganic substance this inorganic substance that we have is called as the gallium nitride so gallium nitride is used and as a result it is much more brighter as a result of usage of this inorganic gallium nitride 
there is longer lifespan and at the same time it offers more brightness as well and hence micro led will revolutionize the future display technology is what is this article all about so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best